Hey, welcome back to the lookout. Uh, you might be wondering why I'm sweating. That's because this episode actually was a lot of work. Anyway, I wanted to start off with a joke. Uh, Jeff Foxworthy says that if you've ever mowed your yard and found a car, you might be a redneck. And um, I don't claim to be a redneck, but I'll, I'll settle for hillbilly. And you can tell a hillbilly because hillbillies like to build sheds. Anyway, welcome to the Lookout. Today we're going to talk about fireproofing for the fall wildfire season. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the wildland urban interface. I live in the city of Chico and it's, you know, it's city. My house was built in the 1950s, but we're adjacent to Bidwell Park and Bidwell Park has got all kinds of fuel in it. And so I'm um, going to just look at some videos and kind of talk about how to perceive of the wildland fire hazards in your neighborhood because we've seen in the last few years that we've had some major wildfires that have burned right into cities and become urban conflagrations. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to read the landscape where you live, the urban landscape, and make some sense of how you can reduce the risk even if you live in a city and don't really think of yourself as being an urban, wildland urban interface dweller. I think a lot more of us are in an urban interface than we might realize. You know, when we talk about Lahaina burning or Paradise burning or the Tubbs fire burning in the Coffee Park in Sonoma County, those aren't really wildfires. You know, they start, maybe they start as a, a grass fire or a brush fire, but once they enter the urban area, they become an urban conflagration, and an urban conflagration is kind of altogether a different thing than wildfire. It's not spread by the vegetation, it's spread by the radiant heat of homes burning, buildings burning, sheds, chicken coops, other um, urban fuel cars. So I think it's important to draw that distinction because we can reduce fuels to um, prevent wildfires from happening, but once you get in an urban environment, say Marin County, uh, we're not going to thin houses. So we're not going to really reduce fuels. What we can do is harden the structures and make them less likely to become available to fire. So when we talk about structure hardening, that's really one of the main reasons to harden structures. One is to save the structure itself, but two is to reduce the likelihood that that burning structure is going to catch the next structure on fire. And what we see in our work a lot is just that it's the first one that matters, right? Once one house is on fire and we don't have firefighters available, it's very likely that the whole neighborhood could burn. And so how do you prevent the very first one from catching on fire? Oftentimes that means identifying the one that's on the edge that has vegetation growing right up to it. And obviously right off the bat, we can't harden every structure, but we really need to prioritize hardening the structures that are gonna be the ones that turn that wildfire into an urban conflagration, the transition. So we've lived in this place about uh, 15 years, built a few sheds here, and I've got a little shed for the lookout, and I've got a little tool shed, got a kind of factory made shed that was here when we moved in. And I mean, frankly, they're a mess, right? If I perceived of living in the country, I might be more aggressive about weed eating and raking and tidying up around them. But here I am, I live in town, right? You know, if I lived in the country and Cal Fire came by, they'd, they'd say, hey, move that lumber pile away from your outbuildings. And But being in town, even though I know professionally that this stuff's a, a hazard and that I could, you know, have a fire here that burned down the lookout, it doesn't register maybe the way it would if I lived on the side of a hill covered with manzanita. You know, I live, I live in town. But all these things, you know, the rosemary right up against my shed, uh, the, the dry grass right up against that. You know, if there was a fire that was moving into this town and throwing embers long distance, the, the problem with these outbuildings being flammable is that once they're on fire, the radiant heat burns the next thing. 
And often, you know, a burning out building will spread to a house and then that house will spread to another house. And what we found in paradise was that the greatest determining factor of whether or not a house survived was whether or not it had another structure within 60 feet that burned. So once your shed's on fire, your chicken coop's on fire, uh, if there's no firefighters around, it's good odds that that radiant heat and embers from that are gonna catch your house on fire as well. So seeing as we've talked about how it only takes one burning structure in a neighborhood to take out the rest of the neighborhood, my friend Jana Valkovic, who studies these things, talks about the idea of herd immunity and that you're, you're only as well off as the worst house in your neighborhood. So uh, why not start with reducing the flammability of your own home? There's a lot of pretty easy things you can do. As easy as raking the dead grass away, cleaning up old boards. If you've got the means to um, replace the, the vents that go into your attic, that's, a good, that's also a good place to start. Um, as for me, I'm not gonna move the lumber away from the lookout because that would require building another shed. So I'm gonna queue up a video here that we produced as part of a presentation on work we did to look at the big picture threat um, and define the wildland urban interface a little better for the city of Chico. Uh, if you wanna hang out and watch that, that's great. If not, thanks for dropping in and um, good luck with your fall wildfire prep. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Lookout. I've got a video today that's based on work I'm doing for my day job, which is um, Deer Creek Resources, a company here in Chico. <clears throat> We're doing a Community Wildfire Protection Plan, or CWPP, for the city of Chico right now. And the aim of the CWPP is really to look at the big picture of wildfire threat to a community and come up with projects that help reduce those threats. So this presentation you're going to see here is um, kind of describing the technical methods we're using to look at fire hazard here in Chico, where I've lived for the last 30 years. Uh, for this project, we use LIDAR. Uh, LIDAR is basically lasers shot from airplanes that return billions of points that describe vegetation and buildings and everything else. So we analyzed that, and then we spent a lot of time driving around and uh, came up with some new maps of places in Chico where the fire hazard is the highest. And also, um, creating maps of places in the community where we feel like um, they should be doing the most outreach and also um, making sure that people are clearing their lots and taking care of their fire business in those neighborhoods. So um, check it out. If you've got comments, um, there's some links in the description on how you can participate in the planning process here in Chico. Thanks a lot. So Chico, California is in the Northern Sacramento Valley of um, California, about an hour and a half north of Sacramento. And it's right up against the foothills of the Sierra Nevada and Cascades. And it's right where they actually come together right on top of Paradise. So we've got this big um, landform that's um, these foothills. And so that gives us some interesting things like um, reliable down canyon night winds, and also a really um, in-depth fire history. You know, this is fire history going back to the 1920s. A lot of human ignitions, but also we've had some, you know, every 10 years or so, we've had big lightning busts to start big fires in the foothills. And then we've got the campfire. So what we just heard about here with Yana is the campfire that was pointed basically straight at Chico. We've got a ton of climate refugees now in Butte County. Butte County's general plan called for growth through uh, 2030 to something like 130,000 people. And we gained that overnight. Basically, everyone in Paradise evacuated to Chico. 16,000 homes burned. Um, so we gained 30,000 people overnight. And a lot of those people were already poor, kind of multi-generational poor. And so they're living in our parks. They're living in trailers in the parks. And um, so that, that, there's these regional effects to what happened in Paradise that are spilling out. A big thing that happened was that um, we type converted a huge proportion of this landscape. What was a pine and oak dominated, shady, nice place, about 2,000 feet elevation, um, now is this barren kind of um, weed lot, right? Like, 
We basically scraped all of the vegetation away to clean up the toxic waste of almost 20,000 burned homes. And now we've got, you know, eight foot tall scotch broom growing on all these, everywhere you see bare dirt there, basically. We've got fuels that haven't been cleaned up. They cut down, you know, hundreds of thousands of trees near roads. But we've got these incredible fuel loads and basically the fire started in the Feather River Canyon, 20 miles from Chico. And it type converted an area that was responding to an earlier fire, 2008 fire. So now suddenly we've got a completely different wildfire picture in Chico, 20 miles away. So we know that the campfire burned 20 miles in an, a day. So it's suddenly like I'm living in Malibu and I've got deep, tall brush east of me with a Santa Ana wind, right? Like there's no reason that the campfire wouldn't have gone into Chico except that the wind stopped blowing at the end of the day. So that's really changed the kind of regional risk profile of Chico. And this is what we wanted to try to address with our modeling, or what are the vulnerabilities that Chico now has? This town of you know, 100,000 people, we've got one of the largest municipal parks in the nation. And it acts basically as a big fuse of wildland that goes right into the middle of our community. So we modeled spread vectors. We built fire behavior models using LIDAR. And these yellow lines represent places that we can see the fire is going to move through the urban vegetation, through the landscaping, um, through vacant lots, through weeds. And we designated some high priority parcels for this. We feel like the previous wooey mapping of the city was really inaccurate. It's just kind of a buffer off of wildland vegetation that doesn't really bear any realistic connection to fire weather, firefighting, anything else. But, so we wanted to kind of nail down, like, where in the community do we have priority parcels where we should be targeting code enforcement and outreach and education. So the spread vulnerability, it shows us basically places where fire can spread from the parklands into the community. And what we learned in the campfire, as Yana said, is that there was no firefighting going on. We had 85 people trapped and killed by the fire and all firefighters were doing were evacuating people. And so where we've got these wildland fuses basically that come into our community, um, we're, we need to harden structures adjacent to that because otherwise one burning structure becomes your urban conflagration. So we're really focused on that, really just the margin where we can, you know, because we're surrounded by grass, we're not really worried about long range spotting. So we're looking at these vulnerabilities. Um, you know, the city has 6,500 acres of open space and parkland, which is amazing to me. But with this climate context, we're talking about, this is where all the refugees are living now. Um, there's you know, been court cases that have prevented the city from enforcing no camping laws. So this is you know, right in these open spaces in the middle of town. We've got people living there and lots of fires, you know, like dozens of fires um, per month happening with warming fires, especially in the fall and winter when we have our winds. But a part of the other context that we're trying to um, address here with our planning is that we've got a lot of opportunities to integrate fire and resource management into other ongoing management of the parks. And we've got a really strong framework that's been created in the last few years around burning and um, land management on these open space lands, including a real emphasis on cultural burning. We wrote a citywide burn plan that kind of centers on cultural burning and making it easy, a one page burn plan for a cultural burn during low complexity times of year, like winter, when you can burn thatch. So that having that um, all that planning in place now has really given us a lot of social license to use fire in the parks. And we see fire as being one of the best tools we have to manage our wildlands right within the urban area. So the modeling really is looking at places where we need to target these prescribed burns. Where are the places where um, we can, on a regular basis, lay down big black buffers on the upwind sides of town. And already we're seeing some benefits from this. We did a burn last year of about 100 acres that was focused on Medusa Head and Star Thistle eradication in a um, really high traffic area of Upper Bidwell Park. And about two months later, we had a wildfire, the park fire, that came down Canyon. And you can see here our burn is tied into a golf course. And this really creates a regional scale buffer against wildfire right in a place where our modeling has identified kind of the highest likelihood of a north wind fire transitioning right into neighborhoods and also into the bulk of the, the park down, um, downwind. So all these lands off to the kind of left-hand side of the screen are open space lands or wetland mitigation preserves um, where we've got license to apply fire. Um, two weeks ago, we burned about 180 acres at the Chico Airport, which also abuts the urban area. And the fire department's really on board with expanding prescribed fire. We're achieving a lot of 
uh, kind of multiple benefits here, rangeland health, uh, fire training. Chico State has got a really um, advanced wildland um, management degree now, and they're training red carding, you know, a couple dozen people a year. And we're able to use these burns to give people NWCG qualifications in fire effects monitoring and help them help the undergrad and grad students get experience towards advancing a fire career. Uh, we're, we've got a survey out right now as part of the CWPP we're doing and the preliminary results is like 70% of the people in town support these burns. And ongoing research there around whether or not we're meeting these objectives of getting rid of the Medusa head and um, start this off. Anyway, um, that's kind of some of the need for modeling. We want to refine our understanding of the WUI. Um, you know, we've got 100,000 people and we don't feel like all of them need to be um, panicked about fire, but we've got about 3,000 parcels where we feel like people really need to pay attention. So this is Lower Bidwell Park. Uh, we've got this incredible Valley Oak overstory, but we've also got a lot of thick understory um, Valley Oak, Poison Oak, um, Wild Plums, uh, Walnut, other ladder fuels that really increase this um, kind of hazard here of getting a problem fire that can torch and spot and cause problems into our adjacent neighborhoods. So I'll talk a little bit now about the methods for our LIDAR. Um, this is just an aerial view of the area we just saw the videos of. Um, and we tried to pull as much as we could out of the LIDAR. We used a train model to map riparian areas. And then we broke the point clouds up and we started stratifying them into um, kind of a five meter pixel and the number of returns per pixel in each strata. So this is the first three feet. LIDAR returns between six and 12 feet. And we stack up just kind of these pixels of the numbers of returns, and we end up with a stacked raster of you know, maybe six or seven LIDAR metrics. Basically, we're doing the same thing you do with vegetation classification with multispectral, like Landsat imagery. So we build a stack of um, canopy metrics. Then we take um, NDVI and other metrics from aerial photos and the tree height. And we start to break that up into flam map inputs to run fire behavior models. So we can take the tree height from this. We can take the canopy base height from places that we've got lighter returns down low. We can create canopy bulk density from all that canopy data. We took fire weather from nearby weather stations, two of them, um, to kind of simulate, one, the campfire type fire, and then also um, fires that are coming not necessarily from the east. We've got kind of a seasonality where most of our fires happen not during the big east winds. This is the result, is a crown fire potential map in the park showing where we've got canopy fuels that give us potential for a crown fire. Now you notice that the whole town basically has crown fire hazard, and that's not the case. So we didn't publish these results as part of our work just because we know that the whole town doesn't have crown fire potential. We know that we've got irrigated landscaping all over the place, that a crepe myrtle might look like a manzanita. And we're, so we're not asking the model to tell us um, where in the urban area we're going to have fire. We're asking the model to tell us where we have continuity between the wildland and the community. So this is just kind of showing some of the inputs for the vegetation mapping we did to characterize surface fuels uh, at a little bit larger scale. You can see our prescribed burn there at the top and how that um, buffered us against in an area that had um, some crown fire hazard. Here's that crown fire potential. So, but to come back to it, it's like, we just want this modeling to advise us to where to go look. You know, none of this replaces a need for us to really know the neighborhoods and spend time on the ground. But this is looking at these flow paths now and where they come out of the park into the neighborhoods. We know that the, these spread arrows are showing places in neighborhoods that we really don't expect fire to burn, but we are really interested in running the model with different iterations and seeing where does it spread out of the wildland and into a neighborhood. And so we found it useful. We'd already done a lot of groundwork, but then to go back to the places that the model was highlighting, uh, it was useful and it did show us places like, hey, there's an irrigation ditch here that you weren't thinking about that's got a lot of tall weeds. And so all of this then just came back to that developing some priority parcel areas for us to target with our outreach. So this is one of the spread vectors and it looks terrible. It looks like you know, fire is going to take over the whole town. But when we look up close, we see like, yeah, a lot of this stuff isn't actually going to happen. You know, the LIDAR, uh, like this whole neighborhood, when we go and look at it, it really, um, 
there's not a lot of potential there. And a, a real handy tool for evaluating this was just Google Street View. We can look and say, okay, well, you know, that's just a hedge. It's not, you know, it's all brush. Anyway, this is the kind of a final product. Uh, as far and we've already in previous planning efforts identified projects to mitigate a lot of the hazards in these urban areas, in the in the drainage ditches, etc. So this is just kind of a way to help us prioritize those projects. Um, I think the most exciting thing about it, obviously, is that we get to go out and burn for the fire department, uh, and that to show that this is possible to do this in an urban park. There's people walking their dogs by while we're doing this, pushing strollers. Uh, the biggest complaint we're hearing is that like now people can see where all the dog shit is in the park. <laughs> um, air quality it hasn't been too big a concern because we're burning almost all, it's all fine fuels and we got really reliable winds that blow up into the hills where no one lives. So there's not a lot of obstacles to us doing this work. Uh, the biggest obstacle with the fire department in the past to doing this work was just that they didn't have funding to pay the overtime because their staffing only covers you know enough to cover their day to day. So anyway, that's um, that's the presentation, and I'm, I left some time for questions. If you have more technical questions, um, I can put you in touch with the people that did the lidar work. <laughs>